I'm the executive editor and associate curator of science and film here at the Museum of the Moving Image and curate our Science on Screen film series. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all today here for the best years of our lives, engineering the body. Science on Screen, in which we explore everything from seahorses to robots to dust, brings scientists and filmmakers to the museum. It is a nationwide initiative of the Coolidge Corner Theater with major support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. So I'm very pleased to be sharing with you William Wyler's beloved Hollywood classic, The Best Years of Our Lives. This was one of the first films to examine the problems that veterans faced when they returned home from war. Wyler wrote that it was the result of his desire to explore the potential of film to illuminate the daily lives of ordinary people. This film was a huge success when it premiered in 1946. It was the second highest grossing film of its time, second only to Gone with the Wind. It was the first film to win eight Academy Awards. One of the film stars, Harold Russell, whom we will talk more about afterwards, was actually awarded two Oscars for the same role in this film. One was honorary. He was a real life veteran with no acting experience. And while he was nominated for Best Supporting Actor, the Academy Award before the award sort of got together and voted to give him an honorary Oscar for the role because maybe they thought that he didn't have a shot of winning. But then of course he did win and then he got a second honorary Oscar uh, with the citation for bringing hope and courage to his fellow veterans through his appearance. As popular as The Best Years of Our Lives was at the time, I think that a new generation of moviegoers can discover it. And for those here who have seen it before, it is, of course, best seen on the big screen. Moreover, we have two fantastic experts here to talk after the film. David Serlin is a professor of communication and science studies and affiliated faculty in critical de gender studies at the University of California, San Diego. He's also an author who's written multiple books, including <laughs> Replaceable You, Engineering the Body in Post-War America, which I highly recommend. It was reading this book that actually gave me the initial idea to uh, include his film in the series. Anita Pear is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Occupational Therapy at NYU. She spearheaded the development of the NYU Ability Project, an interdisciplinary research space for the development of assistive technologies, and she is now the co-director. So I encourage all of you to stick around for our discussion afterwards. And I'll just say that before we begin, today's program is part of the National Week of Science on Screen, during which fellow Science on Screen grantee theaters across 22 states um, in the entire country are also programming films and bringing in scientists to talk about them. So you'll see a brief two minute trailer that just sort of talks about what that is, um, and then we'll go right into the film and I will hope to see you afterwards. Okay, thank you. I am going to start with you, Anita, um, because one thing I want to focus on is uh, the character of Homer, who in the film, uh, you know, is struggling with his disability and how to sort of reintegrate into his his life. Um, and I think, as we see his evolution through the film, it it becomes evident that a large part of of how he'll be able to move forward has to do with really his attitude, I think, and, and his outlook, um, and sort of, you know, being able to be vulnerable as well as, you know, not to mention the support of Wilma and, and um, you know, being able to feel a sense of acceptance from her. Um, so in some ways, his positive embrace of rehabilitation and, and so to speak. So um, I'm curious for you how the way that he copes with his new prosthesis compares to uh, your experience, I guess, with patients. Yeah. I think that's a really good question. Is this on? Yeah, can you hold okay. it? Hold it a little closer. Hold it closer. Yeah, there okay. You go. Um, it, it's true that in rehabilitation, that even though it's a physical injury, there's still all these psychosocial components that are impacting um, his life and returning to his life. So he's dealing with What's it like to be disabled when he wasn't disabled before? Being a bilateral or two-arm amputee is much more complicated than one arm, so he really is relying other, on other people for doing so many things. But he's also lost each of the roles that he had. 
So as a son, his role has changed. As a boyfriend, it's changed. As a worker, it's changed. So he's dealing with so many different changes in himself. And then the other thing that people are dealing with is how that impacts other people. So any self-esteem, any power, any control that he had is also changing. Um, so the two go really hand in hand that you can't forget about one without the other. And, and this thing that seems to help a lot in rehabilitation is meeting other people who have been in similar circumstances or circumstances that you can kind of pull out similar sorts of feelings. Um, and what he's able to do is use the people around him. So Hoagie Carmichael, the, the yeah. uncle in the piano bar, I think does a really good job of making playing a duet hmm. part of a normal routine. And they adapt the way that he does play the piano, but it's still a piano song and it's enjoyable. And that's part of that action of coming back into feeling okay about yourself. That's great. Um, so David, I, I also wanted to ask you, so um, in case for those of you who don't know, this film was actually commissioned by Samuel Goldwyn, um, who was the producer who uh, in 1944 was thinking about the war was ending and he was thinking about what he wanted and he basically thought that he wanted a movie. Um, that was post war that was about the difficulties of social reintegration. So for you, I'm curious um, what you think the film communicates about the perhaps ideals or expect and or expectations, I guess, of veterans um, and maybe you know specifically those with disabilities. But yeah. sure. Well, the uh, when, sometimes when big uh, studios make a film, sometimes it's called a statement film. And this is definitely a great example of a statement film so that a big studio, which releases you know, lots of movies during the course of a year, mm -hmm. will make a film where they are trying to kind of capture the zeitgeist, trying to capture something about this moment. And the fact that this was being planned before the war ended, and the fact that it went into production before the war ended, and it comes out in 1946, everything about it is designed to capture as much as possible what is going on. So there are lots of, you know, in addition to the disability themes that Homer represents that Anita's referring to, all of the other questions, the economic questions, the kind of existential questions, are we going to go to war again? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it doesn't matter because the bomb is going to be dropped and we're all going to be, you know, incinerated tomorrow. So there's all these things that are sort of percolating in the culture at the time that then get kind of targeted around these three figures who represent uh, you know, a cross-section of this little town, Boone City, which apparently has a fantastic nightlife. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, was, it was like one of the sequences of like Manhattan in the 40s, like Boone City, who knew? That it had such a vibrant you know, sort of nightlife. Every, you know, every, every, you know, Carmen Randall looked like they're going there. So, it, so, so there's, so, so there's uh, this way in which, uh, you know, Homer and what he is experiencing and dealing with sort of is, uh, as sometimes is said in, in, in film scholarship, kind of a metonym, sort of a, a stand-in for things that both uh, Fred and Al are going through, but in very different ways. This idea that they are, uh, they ha occupied a particular position uh, in the military, status uh, as well as uh, respect you know the very first image is a Fred being bumped by the rich guy who can get onto the plane because he has the money but veteran status obviously doesn't count for anything in this in this new civilian world um, the, the one last thing I'll say um, is you know when I have taught this film or written about this film I've been so focused on Homer but it really occurred to me in watching this film and I haven't seen it for several years that sort of penultimate scene in the film where Fred is walking through this sort of graveyard of planes. Yeah. Um, and in a way, it is as much a metonym for what exactly is happening, right? The, the, the uselessness or perceived uselessness of these guys who are now back in the civilian world, they can't get a job or they have a hard time integrating. They mm -hmm. are afraid uh, of how their masculinity will be impacted by their disabilities. And what's happening to these planes? Well, they're going to be scrap metal for prefab houses out in Levittowns or the equivalents of Levittowns. That's the world that has now been brought forward by the post-war era. So where do these guys even fit in? So that scene is very haunting in lots of ways. 
Um, but I think it kind of does go to this idea that what Homer is experiencing is kind of in his own private way what these guys are experiencing sort of in their own respective worlds. Yeah, and I, okay, so I wonder whether either of you knows anything about this, um, but obviously war and veterans are still very present in our society, and my understanding is that uh, the military helps to develop prosthetics or prostheses um, in terms of like the actual engineering and technology and all of that, and I'm interested in this sort of dual use. Uh, in one instance for augmented ability, let's say, of people who don't have a disability, and then in the other instance uh, for this sort of supplementary or replacing a, a, an already, you know, a body function that needs to be replaced. Um, and so I'm really it's for either of you, if either of you wants to expand a little bit on that history, I'm particularly interested in that, the sort of identity of ability you know, versus disability. I think, David, in your book, you said something about, you mentioned about cyborgs and veterans, um, and maybe that there are some similarities there with people with prostheses. I, I don't want to go too much into yeah. that, but I do think there's an interesting thing, perhaps, to talk about with this idea of, um, you know, people who have these, even when Homer's joke in the at the soda jerk, like, oh, well, these are the, you know, I just was sick of these old hands, and, like, these are the newest. So along that lines of, of sort of, that's, do you have any? Um, yeah, I can, I can start with it. I'm going to kind of weave in yeah. and out of, of what you're talking about. Um, it's true that a lot of the funding for similar research is still coming from the, um, the Defense Department. And it's used in mu multiple ways. So it's used for rehabilitation of people who need it. And it really is cutting edge of what then kind of trickles down to other people in the community. But it also is used, um, the thought behind it is used in preparation for defense. Mm -hmm. So with the development of exoskeletons for people with spinal cord injury who can't walk, it gives them the ability to walk. But for soldiers who are, have limited strength, it makes them super strong. So it's the same sort of technology that is used um, in multiple ways. And I do have to say also that, that the VA also leads in funding equipment like this for the veterans. So veterans tend to get um, really good services and really good equipment. And that also kind of makes the norm or trickles down to the rest of the population. Um, I'm not really sure how that all started, but I do know that much of the rehab field is because of returning veterans. So much of what we've learned about, about rehabilitation of all people has been with working with veterans who have returned um, from from war, um, the way that I look at things, it's still focusing on function. So, what are the functional abilities that the person has lost or are impaired, and what can we do to build that back up? So, it really is about getting people back to being able to participate in those activities that they want to. Do you have anything? Yeah. Well, I would say you know one thing that. Uh, probably crosses over between the work I do and the work that Nita does is this distinction I think you're drawing attention to between, let's say, uh, what are called um, rehabilitation or uh, restoration technologies, right? So to be able to give someone who lost a particular kinds of function, restore that in some way. And then what are often called enhancement technologies, right. which aren't necessarily related to disability, but are meant to exceed what the human body can do. And so there's this very, strange slippage between those there are there are people who are interested in being able to restore a function so they can do work so they can take care of children so they can take care of themselves mm -hmm. and that's a very different set of expectations or a different set of desires than someone who wants to exceed what's possible right. um, and you know some of the fantasies about cyborgs and, and and robots and artificial intelligence isn't necessarily about people with disabilities it's about people kind of fantasizing about what the future of the human body might look like. And some of that might have be related to, to it. But my interest has always been in not so much the fantasies of what the human body can do, but just really being able to provide people uh, with uh, ways for them to become independent mm -hmm. and to not glamorize it, 
uh, as if everybody has the potential to be RoboCop or some kind of you know uh, cyborg uh, you know fantasy, but instead to be able to give people the capacity to do what they need to do, and that's a much more mm -hmm. it's not a very glamorous you know or science fictiony desire. Yeah. It's actually a very ordinary desire, um, and uh, so it, you know thinking about the differences between those areas, I think is kind of uh, important to hang on to. Yeah. Well, so in your estimation, how does the film do in terms of like giving that sort of accurate or or you know portrayal? I mean, as Weiler said, like he wanted to really just show the struggles of ordinary people. Well, Could you yeah. say a little bit? About sure. That? Well, and and a lot of you probably know this, but uh, William Weiler uh, chose Harold Russell because uh, the army had made a series of I mean many different kinds of sort of instructional films for. Of veterans uh, sort of coming back into civilian life uh, and uh, uh, Harold uh, Russell was the star of one uh, star sounds very odd to say but sort of was featured in one of them called Diary of a Sergeant in which it showed him sort of acclimating to civilian life so these films would be shown um, in auditoriums or they'd be shown in libraries or in you know churches to people in all across the country to kind of as well as at VA hospitals to kind of get a sense of what's possible so can I brush my teeth and can I take care of myself and can I get a job and so it was really meant to highlight what was possible and William Wyler saw Russell in this film and said this guy has incredible presence really uh, like both kind of endearing qualities as well as gravitas and I think he would be great in the role of Homer, which of course he is and was recognized yeah. as such. Um, I think that the thing that's haunting this film that no one really in the film is able to talk about, but which is so present, is the anxiety that Homer clearly feels, not just about getting a job or being a husband, but about performing. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing that haunts all three of them is this sense of how do I go back to a world where there's all this, these expectations of me as husband, boyfriend, uh, you know, potential husband in Homer's case. And I think we see him take her upstairs to his bedroom and shows how he is undressed. And in that way, that also is a kind of metonym for what may happen after their wedding night. Uh, and the anxiety that all of them have and, you know, the, the different characters in the film who kind of are either commenting on or are aware of the kind of fragile masculinity, right? That, that uh, Sergeant Fred is reduced to selling perfume mm -hmm. at the departments, you know, and, and the kind of struggle uh, that um, Al has where he has to kind of be a, a good banker, a good capitalist, but at the same time he knows that those guys don't, you know, really care about the status of veterans uh, and he has to kind of remind them. And, but he, of course he has to get very drunk to, in order to be able to do it. So I think that yeah. Homer's rehabilitation, well, uh, Homer's um, status in the film kind of sheds light on all of them, but that's not to say that he doesn't have his own struggles. That's not to say that he's just a, a big metaphor for what's yeah. going on in the film. His struggle is both about acceptance of himself, but also about trying to insist that he be seen on his own terms and not just as some, you know, p pathetic uh, figure who always has to be chased around and, you know, that he lights, you know, uh, the cigarettes mm -hmm. of everyone at the very beginning of the film, you know, right. is kind of a very uh, quick way for William Wyler to telegraph, don't feel sorry for this guy. He knows exactly what he's doing and he's in control. Whether or not he's able to kind of absorb that as a lesson for himself as he moves forward, that's something that we're going to, it's going to be played out. But that very quick action with the, you know, the flick of the match is sort of lets us know uh, what Weiler's relationship to him is. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was really interesting that he is such a natural actor also. And I would suggest when you see the movie the next time that you take a look at a, a couple of things. For instance, um, so I was watching how he was using his prostheses and seeing how real it was compared to how they're really used. And you'll notice that the hooks on his right hand are coated with rubber. The hooks on his left hand are still metal, which means that one has traction and one is slippery. So he does different tasks with different, mm -hmm. different hooks. When he takes the arms off, he can take the the right off the right arm um, I and mean, the left arm off. It's not attached with straps, which means that he can't open the hook on his own. 
So in order to open the hook on that side, he has to use his other hand. I was going to say, Nina, and can you just tell for people who don't know how these things work, sure, how, how sure. someone who uses these hooks, how, how it works? I can't do it without my hands, though. <laughs> so so the, the prosthesis on the right side, the hook opens so that you can grab onto things. And it has a wrist joint that you can move with the other hand so you can put it in different positions so that when you're opening and closing the hook, it can be in different positions for you. And the way that opens and closes is through the series of straps that attaches to the other side. So as he draws his shoulders together, that force opens that hook, which means that his right side he can manage by himself, but the left side is more dependent. So he uses his right hand to open the hook and, and to manage things. But I thought it was interesting, like when he was smoking a cigarette, he was holding the cigarette in his left hand, and that's because if any of you have been smokers in the past, when you put the cigarette in your mouth, you kind of turn it a little bit and you want it to be able to slide. And so in order to do that, he uses the, the hook that's um, slippery. I thought the other thing that, that is, just seems to be coming around now in the, in the field of disability studies and disability rights is the idea of interdependence versus independence. And while independence is crucial, um, the idea really is that none of us really cares for ourselves independently. We all rely on each other. And this idea of can you help me with this and I will help you with that is um, really what's being talked about and expressed so that people who do have certain abilities, like lighting the match and, and lighting the cigarette, um, he does that and he does that with pride. And what he's trying to figure out is how to ask for help. How do I ask my girlfriend, who's going to be my wife, to be my babysitter? And how do I make those even? How do I keep my self-esteem and still need assistance from other people, which is really complicated. Especially given how much emphasis there was in that period where you know, there are rehabilitation manuals and all other kinds of documents put out by either rehab hospitals or the VA or the Department of Defense saying, you have to learn to manage on your own. Do not depend on anyone else. And so the idea that you would either ask for help or even show that maybe it's a production between several people and that that's, there's no weakness or there's no uh, stigma attached to that, but actually that's a way to live in the world. You know, um, uh, American culture tends to be one of the few that emphasizes so much about you know, being completely independent. We even see that now with you know, the kinds of homes that are being built for disabled vets of, you know, Iraq and, 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 and Afghanistan, so that they should be able to just not have to rely on anybody. But in other parts of the world, and in lots of parts of the culture, to be able to have a kind of uh, several people with whom you kind of share the tasks of doing things, that's how you get through life. It's not a weakness, it's actually a strength yeah. to be able to have, you know, a number of people who help you yeah. with you know, getting through the day. Yeah, and I, I think the important thing now is that people need to have choice. So that there's some agency in what they control and what they pass along to other people. And in our culture, it's still really economic based. Mm -hmm. um, so that if there's something that you can't do, it's okay to pay somebody for it, but it's still not acceptable to ask somebody for help and to receive help. And I, and I think going forward that that's where the community mm -hmm. is also going. Yeah, one of the things that that brings up is just this thing that is idea that I wanted to talk to you both about, which is that you know there is this norm of able-bodiedness that we all exist in, and that's that's something to strive for. That I think this film shows is that culturally that's like it's sort of not thought about as like, oh, of course, everybody, we live in, everybody just has to learn how to adjust to this world that we live in, and that, that is also a, a construction, right? I mean, that, that's not how the world is, like, on its own. Um, and I wanted to uh, ask you about um, this term that I learned about, but I know other people know about um, called Crip that I learned by reading Sonara Taylor's book Beasts of Burden. If any of you have read it, I really recommend it. And she calls out the category of disability as you know a social construction, which she says has had perhaps fewer opportunities than other minority groups to develop an identity and a culture. Um, and the word Crip, which comes from crippled, um, she calls 
out as a word that's invested with disability, history, politics, and pride, while simultaneously questioning paradigms of independence, normalcy, and medicalization. So I'm curious, Anita, for you, how you engage in the, um, I guess, the social construction of, of disability in your work. Yeah, um, I, I, I come around things and go back and forth where I'm coming from because they do come from the medical yeah. community. So it's, it's hard and easy for me to maintain that. I think that the way that I think about things is that each of us has a talent and an interest and an expertise. And in order for anything to get done, it takes people with a variety of different backgrounds. So um, to, to talk with extremists, so medical personnel who think that the answer is a cure, anything less than a cure is failure, to the, the opposite end with, um, we could look at deaf, deaf culture where deafness is the way to be and everybody else is wrong and that people need to adapt to the deaf community instead of the other way around. I think it's all on a continuum and I kind of go back and forth, but I, I again just go back to people having control over what they define as what they want to do. And I think that I think this this thing with language I think is wonderful because like you're saying with every other minority community there is language that's okay within the community and you know codes that that are meant for people within the community and other people kind of don't know what to do with it and I think that discomfort is also a good thing to make you think about who owns this language. Mm -hmm. I mean it, it's we were sit talking before uh, the movie started and. You know, for a very long time, among sort of people who identify as sort of in the sort of LGBT community, the idea of queer being called queer or identifying something as queer was seen as offensive because of the the kind of history of that word. And then, sort of in the context of of crip, you know, that it has been embraced by a kind of more recent generation of disability rights activists mm -hmm. as a way of saying this is a word that's been applied to us, and we're going to reclaim it, yeah. and we're going to kind of reuse it and kind of turn it on its head. Sort of in a, embrace the stigma, I guess you would say. But I guess in terms of you know these questions of like when Sonny Taylor uses says or declares as lots of other people do that disability is a social construction. I think you know one of the things to that she and other people are trying to make a distinction between is to say that the, the body has an impairment or that you know our, or a range of abilities is different than this kind of category or stamp of disabled, right? Right, because you know, let's face it, you know, everyone has a kind of uh, range within which they operate in some normative way, and then mm -hmm. it exceeds it, you know, without my glasses, I can't, uh, you know, move around. And lots of people who, you know, don't even think about themselves as disabled in some, uh, like, identity-based way, you know, it's sort of how they get through the day. Um, maybe they need a little extra time to get up a flight of stairs or whatever it happens to be. Um, so impairment as a kind of difference uh, as a different way of thinking about things than dis disabled because as the example of sort of the deaf uh, community sort of makes clear that it's not so much that disability is a kind of constant but it really depends on the context mm -hmm. right so if a deaf person is in this audience and you know he or she can't understand what's going on but there is a sign language interpreter then they're not disabled they are able to yeah. experience things you know and that would be true of someone who was blind or someone who you know was unable to get through the door because there's no ramp so environmental changes and technological innovations kind of erase the possibility that there's this category of you know you're disabled and you can't move forward or you can't kind of participate so impairment exists but that's different than kind of this categorical kind of status of saying you're disabled and so therefore you're over there and we're over here, yeah. you know, and I think that that is sort of what she is uh, um, pointing toward when she says something like disability is a social construction, that mm -hmm. the social is actually able to absorb lots of things so that it doesn't rely on one individual to figure everything out for him or herself, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, that's what the ADA is there to do, yeah. is to say, no, it's not up to you to figure out how to navigate through life, but it's actually up to the law or the, the built environment or society to kind of help make accommodations and adjustments so that you can be part of a larger democratic society. 
Okay, I'm curious if anybody uh, has a question that they would like to ask. Yeah, I see if you're in the middle there, yeah. I'm wondering, I'm thinking about this film in terms of shared vulnerability and like an American historical mythology, like being a country that had some foundations of predestination, puritanism, of proving your individual work. And I mean, like in the film, it's a drugstore cowboy. The cowboy is such a strong foundation. And to be vulnerable, especially, you know, with that, like as a warrior, uh, and sharing that vulnerability when um, it seems like, you know, um, there's a level of certain, like, so uh, we have self-reliance, say, Emerson's self-reliance and Melville's critique on that of Ahab as the extremity of that, of that we really do, you, the individual, like, celebrating the individual has problems. So when, like, even, like, the soldiers are, like, this, this might, this dominance. So I'm thinking about like the excess of that, or even like the violence of the gun. So she comes, like one comes on him in a gun, and that, that there's that fragility, the danger of that. So thinking of like in a, in a current societal state right now where we have like a leader, a presidential leader, who's like, you know, that excess of dominance and afraid of even showing vulnerability. So I'm, I'm just curious, like, in a country that operates like this, how do we approach this to reduce this like danger of hyper individualism versus what the reality is that we have shared interdependent shared vulnerability? Well, in terms of the mythology question, right? This is unique. I mean, th this is a 1946 film about veterans, but of course they're veterans of war. And think about all the films that would have been coming out contemporary with this long after this, from, you know, even before America enters into the war, you know, formally, you know, in 1943, that are, are all about, you know, these soldiers with guns who are, you know, attacking enemies and, you know, racking up points and, and the kind of the mythology of the, the soldier, which then gets, you could say, carried over into the mythology of the cowboy in the 1950s and TV. And this is about um, these men whose solidarity is forged, you know, and the and the vulnerability, which is not just with their girlfriends and wives and family members, but uh, even among themselves, that they're able to talk about things um, with each other, and that their bonding, uh, sort of in a way, requires them to all converge at butches, and not just have a drink, but also to be next to each other. This kind of shared uh, experience uh, that it's very hard to translate to anyone. I mean, so you can have your wife, your kids, your girlfriend, but they they will not necessarily ever be able to to translate that you know when you were solidarity brotherhood fellowship whatever to other people um, and that's something that this, this is rather radical about this film that you can show the there there the it's not just and how do they negotiate being tough guys and family men and all that it's actually about how do you integrate back into a world where. American culture expects you to be strong individual men, but actually the strength that you've just experienced in war comes from the shared experiences with other men. That is maybe the hardest thing to integrate. So in a way, it's turning the mythology upside down of what a strong man is supposed to be. You know, this is not the Marlboro men. This is not those kind of stereotypes of the cowboy. There, there. It's about being fragile with each other, not just you know with their wives and girlfriends behind closed doors. And only through that are they then able to move forward with those lines. And yeah. 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 Which maybe goes back to what you were saying, Anita, in terms of uh, living, uh, I'm not going to say the right word, but existing on a spectrum of interdependence. I think also um, with that, that it's still in 2019, it still hasn't really become about the intersections of everything that people are. So. Although there were disabled people and non-disabled people in the film, everybody was white, the men had male roles, the women had female roles, and there was really no discussion. So I wonder what a similar film would be like now where you talk about gender identity, when you talk about race, when you talk about religion, when you talk about ageism, when you mm -hmm. talk about all these other things that people are now paying attention to. 
and then disability is overlapped over that and it you it's hard to tease out what's disability what's race what's what's religion what's gender and and it's just a big bowl of spaghetti and everybody has to figure it out for themselves mm -hmm. There was a black woman cleaning up in the woman. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Also in the role that was. Two seconds. Two seconds. Yeah. That's right. Okay. I think I saw a hand up there. Yeah. I'm uh, curious in the uh, 70 plus years since this movie was made, what the development, technical, uh, mm -hmm. technological development is of the, the hooks mm -hmm. so that in today's age they are more aesthetically, visually mm -hmm. more pleasing. Yeah. It, I think it goes in two directions. I, lots of people who want function still use hooks because they're the most functional and easy to use. And then the advances have gotten really in uh, scientific directions towards myoelectric control, brain control over the movements of the arms. And then in the other direction is also split into two is the realism that's in the prosthetic limbs. So hands flesh colored is now not just beige flesh color comes in a variety of fleshes for the spectrum of people who have flesh well, to match something realistic could still function like the hooks did way back when um it some function some are limited to function just in in the fingers the other fingers um don't work myoelectric um hands have function in all the fingers um but they're really looked at separately some of the best artists use the person's other hand or other body parts to to make the flesh look as though it is flesh and then it, it's been taken then to the next level in two ways one in terms of function where um, the piece that the hook is um, is called a terminal device and there's all kinds of terminal devices so that a carpenter can get a hammer so that he can switch out the hammer or she can sorry switch out the hammer from other tools so that there are other functional uses of that terminal device. And then also in the art field that these prosthetic limbs have become art pieces as well. And so if you look especially at some of the lower extremity prostheses, the ones that are built for speed and running and jumping really have the engineering principles built in so that they can perform. And this is where there's difficulties with performance better than what a human can do. And is it fair to compete or not compete? Um, and then similarly uh, with um, lower extremity limbs that are, are decorated with things that are important to the person or become art pieces for models who are amputees in runway shows. So, so it's definitely changing. Um, it's just, for me, I think it's just that it's not so common that it's not everywhere. And you still have to kind of be in the right circle to run into these things where I think that when people are everywhere doing what they want to do, that then there will be, be that equality that people are looking for. And how far back does this development go? And the movie was 46. Did the development go like 30 years before this invention? Oh. Further than that, well, I, yeah. I, well, one thing I just wanted to add is that this question about you know a more sort of aesthetically pleasing, a more realistic hand, people have been working on various versions of this long before 1946. You know, you can find uh, leather leather covered or wooden or metal uh, versions of prosthetic hands going back to the 18th and 19th centuries. If you were a wealthy person uh, 150, 200 years ago, you might have a beautifully crafted, articulated wooden hand because you weren't working. You were just a member of a, you know, kind of genteel society and you just had something that was realistic looking so that you could go about your, your daily business. Or, you know, there's a museum piece at the Wellcome Institute in, um, in London for a pianist who lost a hand and there are sort of little sort of uh, green felt pads on the end of each finger so they could play the piano. So there's been a, a, a lot of different design uh, directions for prosthesis, but the one point that I think Anita sort of uh, pointed to early on is that the ones that function best for the uh, user are not necessarily the ones that we, who are not disabled, find aesthetically pleasing. So a split hook is incredibly useful. The ones that look realistic, not so much. 
So one choice that someone with a, a prosthetic hand sometimes has to decide is, do I want to do something where I can kind of accomplish tasks or do I want to make it so that people don't look away from me? And I hope that they choose the former rather than the latter, but I guess it depends on what context you are living in. Yeah, I, I see it as having the opportunity for all of it. Because yeah. if you look at somebody's shoe closet, you have five different pairs of sneakers for different activities. That's you true. have walking shoes that are low, you have high heels, you have sandals, you have you know all these different That's things. True. So it kind of makes sense that that should also be for other things. But I think it also depends on sort of where you are uh, economically because uh, some of you may know this already, but you know, for every veteran that has access to uh, prosthetic devices that are cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, there are veterans of earlier wars or even people who sort of have, are living on the margins, there is a very brisk secondhand prosthetic uh, 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 sales on places like eBay or Etsy because a lot of people can't afford it or they don't have insurance. So a secondhand device from a, you know, an earlier generation or two might have to make, someone might have to make do with because they don't have access to things. So there's like a black market of prosthetic devices for people who don't have access to the kind of more sort of cutting edge ones. I think that's great. I think that, you know, we all buy stuff on eBay that's used by other people and, and that it's part of the charm of it. I work a lot with people who are wheelchair users and um, a little bit less glamorous people who use um, bathroom equipment like commodes and shower seats and those sorts of things. Right. You, you can't easily have um, secondary sales because of the liability that's associated with it. So yeah. we end up with all of this stuff that's still usable that then gets donated to third world countries or, or underdeveloped nations that um, can use it. And, and so I like the idea actually of having prosthetic limbs available and I'm gonna go home and look for them. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I, I have a couple of examples at home from eBay. Uh, you're taking the arms out of people that need them. No, these are collect these are definitely collectors items. Definitely collectors items. So I would not know. I I, I'm, I, I can be cruel but not that cruel. <laughs> I will just add that I think the first known prosthetic device was in ancient Egypt. Yeah. It was a, a, a toe, right? A carved wooden toe. So you can look that up. We have to, we can take one more question and then we'll have to wrap up. Yeah. I have one question. What did you think of the author's perception of the lack of support for the veterans with regards to economics, getting a loan, not getting on a plane? Um, that I found to be the overriding issue in the play in the show, versus the uh, you know the uh, the disability that, that the one fellow had. What did you think of that? Well, I'll just say quickly that you know we uh, kind of per perceive, especially because you know when um, when Al gives a loan to that the guy who wants to be a farmer, you know he is speaking in relation to the GI Bill, and the GI Bill. Uh, opened up incredible doors, economic doors, uh, home ownership doors, um, uh, educational doors, unbelievable. But it did not necessarily stop lots of employers from saying, I'm not going to hire a guy like a Homer. You know, how am I? I've got all this. And, and this is also important to remember. This is in 1946, the country was predominantly an industrial economy. It was not one of people sitting behind desks or, you know, computers or. 20, 30 years into the future. So a lot of people are looking at these disabled uh, you know, veterans and saying, well, you know, I feel my heart goes out to them, but we have work to do and we can't just take a risk on these guys. So the bias against you know, disabled veterans um, is, was, was high. Um, that, that scene where the kind of smarmy guy is talking to Dan Andrews saying, you know, well, we, it would be nice to just hire all these veterans, but we need guys who don't have any psychological problems. We need guys who aren't going to be a liability to us in some way. So it, the, the film is also very pointed. It's a, you don't think of it as a political film, but it's actually a very political film with regard to the way it's drawing attention to the treatment the, or the mistreatment of veterans, the kind of uh, status that some are given. Uh, o over others, uh, and of course the kind of individual struggles that each one of them is experiencing. Dana Andrews' uh, character, uh, Fred, was is a captain, very high-ranking official, and he comes back and he's no money. 
And he is, you know, his subordinate is Al, who's a very wealthy banker. So the kind of status that you have in the military doesn't, doesn't automatically translate into the status that you have in the civilian world. And so it's a very pointed moment when you recognize that uh, they, are, um, they have roles that are not going to translate into the kind of civilian world that they're going to occupy. I think also the one thing that's frustrating to me is that although it's changed some, it hasn't changed enough. And that the majority of people with disabilities still don't work. The majority of people with disabilities are still living below the means of the mm -hmm. average person without disabilities. And I, I think that for me, it makes me angry and makes me want to do something. Um, and where I am, I'm, I don't know if I want to do something local by helping individual people or where it makes most sense to do something on a grander scale so that it helps populations in general. Okay, with that, I want to thank Anita Perrin, David Serlin, and all of you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just say, uh, stay tuned for upcoming Science on Screen programs. Our next one is April 28th, um, called Wild Lives, and we will be showing two documentaries from different eras that regard interspecies co-implementation. So Ooh. please come back. Okay, thanks a lot.